Choosing a power supply is probably one of the more important decisions you'll make when starting a new electronics project. And most of the time, you are mostly focused on what voltage it can deliver. If, just for this video, we stay focused on DC to DC converters, you have a few options. If you need to step down a voltage, just use a linear regulator. Or if you need the efficiency, use a buck converter. But what about stepping up a voltage? Well, you have a couple of options. The first and most famous is a boost converter, and I've already made a video about that in the past. But there's a second, less known option known as a charge pump, and they have a lot of advantages over boost converters. So in this video, I'll tell you about charge pumps, how you can use them, how they work, and how they stack up against boost converters. Let's start with the charge pump, and then we will get into the comparisons. The idea behind a charge pump is really simple, and there are two basic components behind this design. Diodes and capacitors. For now, we'll focus just on the capacitor. When we apply a voltage to this capacitor here, it will charge up to the supply voltage, in this case 5 volts and it will maintain this voltage potential even when the power supply is removed. Cool, but this doesn't increase our supply voltage, now does it? But then, let's add another capacitor and charge it up in parallel with the first one. Now, they both have a 5 volt drop across them. We can now do a bit of rearranging and put them in series with one another. Remember, voltage sources add up in series, so we should now have 10 volts across the two of them. And, of course, the voltage will drop when a load is placed across it. So, there are two problems. First, we need to obviously use a non-mechanical method to place the capacitors in series. And second, we need to continuously recharge or pump the capacitors to maintain the voltage. We can use a few diodes, like I mentioned earlier, to handle both of these problems. Luckily, there is a rather famous circuit that has already been made that we can use. It's called the Cockroft Walton Voltage Multiplier, named after John Cockroft and Ernest Walton, who together used it in their particle accelerator. The circuit follows this repeatable triangular pattern, and here's the version that I'll be using for our circuit. It should give us 4 times the peak input AC voltage. So I set up my function generator to give me a 10 volt peak to peak 60 hertz sine wave, which means we'll have a positive peak of 5 volts. So we should expect about 20 volts DC output. And yes, checking out the oscilloscope, we get this bumpy DC output, but we don't get the full 20 volts. But this can be attributed to the voltage drop from the diodes. The voltage will also break down under a load as small as 10 kilo ohms, but I'm sure that the internal resistance of the function generator is limiting that, and we can fix that problem later. Anyways, I'm sure some of you are really wondering how this works, so let's get into it. Let's begin with our supply at 0 volts, and all the capacitors discharged. Now let's go into the first positive portion of our sine wave. The diode will protect our capacitor from being charged up in the reverse direction, so nothing happens yet. In the next negative portion, our first capacitor will charge up the positive 5 volts through the diode, since ground is larger than the negative 5 volts being supplied by the supply. In real life, this diode will cause a voltage drop, but for now, let's just assume an ideal diode for our explanation to keep things simple. Moving back into the positive region in the supply, our diode will prevent the capacitor from discharging back into the supply. So just like earlier, the supply and the capacitor will add up to create a larger voltage together. At this point, the next diode provides a path to charge up the next capacitor. When the supply returns back to a negative voltage, we will start charging up the first capacitor, but we will also simultaneously charge up the third capacitor. And again, in the positive region, the supply and the top two capacitors will all three add up together their voltages in series to ultimately charge up the fourth capacitor. The best part about the circuit is that it is repeatable. Just add another pair of diodes and a pair of capacitors and you will multiply it twice again. This is an amazing multiplier, and you can get really high DC voltages using this method. Plus, it's much cheaper than buying a transformer for stepping up voltages. But it isn't the DC to DC converter like I promised. We still used AC at the start. So let's make some changes to correct this. The first thought that I had was to create an AC signal from the DC that we have. We will need a split supply for this. So I just quickly rigged a voltage divider up to an op amp to provide us with a voltage reference of half the supply voltage to act as our virtual ground. As for the actual AC waveform, I opted to go for a 555 timer. This will provide us a nicely adjustable square wave. The DC power supply for this setup will be 10 volts, just so we can match the setup from the beginning. And we do get much better results when we complete everything. The biggest question I still had though was what effect would increasing the frequency have on the circuit. So far, we've just been running at 60 Hz, 
so I cranked it all the way up to 1 kHz. And as you can see, the output waveform actually smooths out. This is probably because the capacitor gets pumped up much more often, which keeps it from discharging too much. While this is a good improvement to our multiplier, it's still a bit impractical if you're starting with a DC voltage. It'd be much better if we could avoid creating virtual grounds and intermediate AC signals. Luckily, there is yet another circuit which is just a modification of the first, and it's known as the Dixon charge pump. Here's the version that we will be using this time, and just like the last one, it's repeatable so you can add as many stages as you want to increase the multiplication. But this time I'll stick with the 4 times multiplication. So if we use 5 volts, we should get about 20 volts out. The only missing part here are these two clock inputs. We already have a clock from the first version, which was the 555 timer. And for the second clock, all we have to do is invert the first clock signal, and we can easily do that with a transistor. As for the operation of this circuit, it's very similar to the first, because really, it's just rearranged. We will start with the first input being low, so we will charge up the first capacitor. Then when it goes high, we add the clock and the capacitor voltages together, so we get twice the original voltage. At the same time, the second input is low, meaning that we can charge the second capacitor up from the first stage. When the second input goes high, the voltages add together again, and we can charge the third. This voltage shifting and adding repeats for as many stages as you have until you reach the end, where we just have a capacitor connected to ground to smooth things out. This works really well in real life too, and we can get pretty close to what we expected. There's another trick that we can use to make this even more useful. If you reverse the direction of the diodes and replace the power source with ground, you can generate negative voltages with the charge bump. This can be great for those low power op amp circuits where you need a dual rail power supply. This charge pump really is an amazing circuit, but the question still remains. Should you use a charge pump or a boost converter for your circuits? And how do they compare? Well, the biggest consideration is how much power you will need. If we take a look at our charge pump circuit, we will find that it breaks down quite quickly even with a small load of just a few milliamps. You can improve this to a certain extent with bigger and bigger capacitors, but that eventually becomes impractical. On the other hand, a boost converter is much more equipped to handle those larger current draws because of the inductor that it uses, which allows for larger and continuous loads. This inductor, though, is one of the boost converter's bigger downsides. Inductors are simply much more expensive and much larger than a capacitor would be. And finally, for the final comparison, I'd say that the charge pump is definitely a lot simpler to create than the boost converter. Any of you who've watched my boost converter video will remember that it was much more complicated to set up a boost converter than it is to set up a charge pump. So as a general rule of thumb, if you need less than a couple hundred milliamps, I'd say stick with the charge pump. Otherwise, go for a boost converter. So what are some use cases for such a charge pump? Well, most obviously, any circuit that uses hardly any current but needs a high voltage supply is a good candidate. The interesting part is, though, the charge pump finds more usage in subsystems of an overall larger circuit. Take for example my most recent video about parallel programmers for AVR microcontrollers. In that video, I started with a 12 volt input and regulated it down to 5 volts for everything else. But an even better approach to the power supply would have been to start with 5 volts and then boost it up to 12 volts using the charge pump. The reset pin is the only thing that needed the 12 volts, and it used barely any current so it would have been perfect for this and would have saved a ton of efficiency. The other major use case that I can think of is definitely bootstrapping MOSFETs. And now when I say bootstrap, I mean using a charge pump to activate an N-channel MOSFET fully. You see, some MOSFETs have a large gate voltage requirement, such as the IRL Z44N, which needs 10 volts to fully turn on. This can be a real challenge if you're running on a 5 volt supply. The same problem also happens when you try to use an N-channel MOSFET on the high side of a load. At this point, you would need a voltage larger than your supplier to turn it on. In both of these cases, you could use a charge pump to activate the MOSFET. Well, that should just about do it for charge pumps. They are really overshadowed by boost converters, so hopefully you can find a use for one of them in one of your projects. If you've enjoyed this video and learned something new, I'd really like to encourage you to check out my Buy Me A Coffee page. You see, these videos take a considerable amount of time and effort to make, and with your support, I can continue making more of them. Big thanks to the people who are already supporting me. You really make everything possible. Anyways, thanks for watching. Have a good one!